patients would come to lie on this very couch, and as he listened, they'd share their innermost fears and anxieties. Their intimate, very personal stories would nourish a radical and controversial new way of understanding our pasts, our desires, what drives our every action, ideas that would take the world by storm. Because this couch belonged to Dr. Sigmund Freud. The 19th century witnessed unprecedented change. Transformed by revolutions in industry, science and society. It was an age that questioned traditional authority and produced three game-changing thinkers. Karl Marx attacked the social and economic order. Friedrich Nietzsche took on Christian morality. And Freud questioned the very essence of who we are. Their penetrating, often contentious ways of seeing the world still shape how we make sense of our lives today. I started as a neurologist trying to bring the relief to my neurotic patients. Sigmund Freud's ideas not only spearheaded a massive leap forward in how we treat illnesses of the mind, they also had a pivotal cultural impact. The freedom we take for granted today to talk openly about our deepest feelings from sexual difference to inner demons. The slogans that power our consumer society stem in part from his ideas. From Freud, we get the notion of the unconscious mind as a reservoir of irrational, conflicting impulses. His ideas have become part of our vocabulary. Penis envy, the pleasure principle, wish fulfillment, and of course, the Freudian slip. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. But Freud's always been controversial. For some, he's not a genius, but a charlatan obsessed with sex, whose speculative theories are impossible to prove, and whose methods are positively dangerous. Resistance was strong and unrelenting. Freud's ideas still provoke intense debate today, but what's not in doubt is that his innovative mapping of the human mind challenged taboos and conventions in ways that fundamentally changed our conception of self. In the end, I succeeded. My name, Sigmund Freud. To understand how Freud's ideas evolved and how they add up, it seems appropriate to adopt an approach that Freud himself pioneered, something that we now take for granted. To look for the keys for his motivation and character by exploring his childhood experiences. When Sigmund Freud was born here, in 1856, the town was called Freiburg, in Moravia, part of the Habsburg Empire. Freud was born with a call, and that's when part of the fetal membrane is still attached to the baby's head. And in those superstitious times, this was considered a good omen. Freud's mother certainly interpreted it as a sign that her newborn son was destined for happiness and fame. Freud's Jewish parents could only afford to rent a single room in this building. And family life was complex. His mother was 20 years younger than his father, 
who'd been married before and had two adult sons. And so one of Sigmund's half-brothers was even older than his mum. Sigmund's closest playmate was in fact his own nephew. But they were to be wrenched apart. Because when Sigmund was three, his father's small business selling wool collapsed, scattering the entire family in search of work. Life may have been imperfect, but where Freud's family ended up would prove to be a critical factor in the future success of the young boy. Vienna in the 1860s, imperial capital of the Habsburg Empire, was a city at the forefront of social change. The Europe-wide revolutions of 1848 had undermined aristocratic, conservative rule here, allowing a kind of edgy liberalism to flourish on the streets. There were also an unusual number of immigrants in the city, so Freud would have grown up surrounded by a cosmopolitan mix of voices and cultures. This is the Jewish district where Freud's family first lived. It was poor and overcrowded, but many capitalised on the opportunities that the city offered and quickly rose from the margins. They became newspaper magnates and bankers, academics, doctors and lawyers. Freud's parents passionately wanted the same for their clever eldest son. Of his six siblings, he was the only one given his own room to work in, and he topped his class for seven years. The young Freud's intense studies seem to have fed into his self-image as someone destined for greatness. He found inspiration in ancient civilizations, in the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. And he came to identify with powerful heroic figures from history and literature, like Moses and Hannibal and Alexander the Great. In 1873, at the age of 17, Sigmund sought his own glory at Vienna University. Initially dabbling in philosophy and law, he was soon drawn to the university's celebrated natural scientists and their guiding light, the Englishman Charles Darwin. Darwin's remarkable, epoch-defining theory of evolution chimed with Freud's desire for kudos and celebrity. But to match up to his hero meant hours of meticulous, painstaking, not obviously glamorous laboratory work, trying to unravel the mysteries of the nervous system of fish. Freud himself said that his studies in anatomy, zoology, chemistry and botany made him a godless medical man and an empiricist. And certainly his time here nurtured a scientific worldview that never left him. If you look at this picture of him from the time, you can just imagine the precise clinical fish dissector, a man who seems to be both neat and orderly in appearance and character. At age 25, Freud fell wildly in love with a young woman, Martha Bernays. Their early correspondence reveals an altogether different side to Freud. There's probably 1,600 letters in all. <laughs> they were writing more or less every day, sometimes two or even three letters a day. Bits of have been released of his letters alone, but this is the first time now that we're seeing her letters. How brilliant. So we've got Martha's voice. What's she saying? What, what does she write about here? Well, anything and everything. I mean, in this case, she had just sent Freud a lock of her hair to put in a little brooch, you know, as lovers do. And Freud had written back, I hope you didn't tear it out, or, it did, or did it come out when you were combing? 
So here, in this letter here, she is taking him to task for his ignorance. She says, you know, you're a doctor, you have no idea of the code of love. One does not send one's lover ripped out or combed out hair. Mm. I suppose this is the first time he's, he's had a full-blown love it's affair. It's his first and his only. And this is one of the things about these letters. You get an insight into Freud that you'll get nowhere else. And he's losing his control sometimes. That he really is almost on the edge of a nervous breakdown when, when he feels they can't go on, when he feels there's an impossible disagreement between her. She is for sweeping it under the carpet. She says, why do you wallow around in this stuff that makes us miserable? And he says, you know, you have to face it, you have to talk through it. That's fascinating. So it's almost like we've got Freud, the, the proto-psychoanalyst here. Yes. I mean, the, the psychoanalytic dictum is, say everything that's on your mind, don't censor, don't repress. It's there already. Martha had opened Freud's eyes to a world of demanding human emotion. And the financial pressures of their engagement saw him casting around for opportunities beyond the lab. Eventually, he abandoned his research career to study medicine. And one day, when he was reading a medical journal, he came across something that he was convinced would make his name. In 1884, he wrote to Martha about a magical drug, little known at the time, in this pretty sober analysis, he says, I take very small doses of it regularly against depression and against indigestion and with the most brilliant success. But then just listen to this when he's also writing to Martha, where he sounds suspiciously like he's under the influence. Woe to you, my princess, when I come. You shall see who is the stronger, a gentle little girl who does not eat enough or a big, wild man who has cocaine in his body. At first, Freud denied that cocaine was harmful, but his rash endorsement would damage his reputation. When he gave it to a friend suffering from morphine addiction in the hope that cocaine would cure him, the consequences were disastrous. His friend became as addicted to the new drug as he had been to the old. Freud did manage to give up cocaine, but his appetite for experimentation would not be stilled. He had a new interest, neurology, the study of nervous diseases. And he made a very canny move, traveling to the center of this burgeoning science, an intellectual hotspot. This is Salpetriere, in Freud's day, a kind of medical poorhouse, a bleak dumping ground for some 5,000 women, many of whom were diagnosed as hysterical. Hysteria, from the Greek word for womb, was a mysterious condition that was thought to afflict women from the ancient world onwards. Really, it was just a catch-all diagnosis for all kinds of nervous symptoms from fits and paralysis to anxiety and headaches. And for centuries, it was a dangerous tool in the hands of male doctors who were trigger happy in diagnosing women as hysterical to the point where they incarcerated perfectly sane individuals in hospitals and asylums. Freud came to Salpetriere to study with the preeminent pioneer of neurology, Jean Martin Charcot. Having discovered that some nervous conditions like multiple sclerosis were the result of lesions on the brain, Charcot turned his attention to the mysteries of hysteria. If Charcot approaches hysteria more scientifically and more seriously and doesn't think of it as simply a woman's ailment and he sees distinct phases. He talks about the epileptoid phase, a tonic phase, a fit. And the fit was 
epileptic rigidity. He then talks about clonic phase or the clown phase where these huge thrashing movements take place. So he's identified these different phases. What, what, what kinds of methods is he using to kind of further his scientific inquiry? Well, Shaku uses hypnosis to diagnose hysteria. He thinks that if women are susceptible and men are susceptible to hypnosis, that's probably a sign that they do have hysteria. But he also uses hypnosis in his great public lectures to which, you know, um, all of Paris comes. Getting a ticket to go to one of Shaku's public lectures is like going to the best play in London. <laughs> so the patients were, were on display in these public lectures? The patients were on display and um, under hypnosis they will begin to walk and they will talk and they will effectively do what the medic asks of them. So we know that Freud's there, he's in the audience, he's one of Charcot's pupils. Do we know what kind of an impact this had on Freud? Well, I think it has an immense impact. Um, he begins to see that there are different forms of uh, thinking and activity going on in the human mind simultaneously and that there are whole areas of the human mind that are there ready to be plumbed <laughs> Freud returned to Vienna age 29 full of new ideas and career plans but things certainly weren't easy for Freud when he first opened his practice in this apartment block in 1886, business was depressingly slow. Sometimes he couldn't even afford a cab to make house calls, and he could only marry Martha in the same year thanks to gifts and loans from friends. One of Freud's principal benefactors was the eminent physician Joseph Breuer. Like Freud, Breuer was curious about the scientific mysteries of hysteria. One of his old patients stood out. Breuer had treated a highly intelligent young woman from an affluent Jewish family called Bertha Pappenheim, giving her the pseudonym Anna O. She experienced hallucinations and suffered from partial paralysis. Times she could only speak English. She appeared to have a split personality. Now, Anna's case really fascinated Freud, partly because of her extreme symptoms, but also because of the innovative way that Breuer treated her. During Breuer's consultations, Anna fell into a state of hypnosis and revealed melancholic details of her personal history. The talking revived significant or painful memories of past events that had been forgotten or somehow blocked up and suppressed. Breuer found that he could trace Anna's numerous symptoms back to original traumas. When Anna showed an aversion to drinking water, Breuer linked it back to her seeing a dog being allowed to drink out of the glass of its owner. But once she expressed her submerged disgust, her hydrophobia vanished. Freud realised that Breuer might have stumbled upon not just an explanation, but a cure for hysteria. Working from new larger premises at number 19 Berggasse, he began to apply Breuer's cathartic treatment to his own neurotic patients. But Freud had a problem. He just couldn't hypnotise all of his patients. So he smartly turned a failing into a virtue and developed his own version of a talking therapy. Freud asked his patients to lie on this couch while he sat here behind them out of sight. He encouraged them to say whatever came into their minds, almost as if they were talking to themselves. He proved to be an alert listener, systematically sifting through and probing his patients' memories. Interpreting their confessions rapidly, intuitively, he attempted to unlock what was being suppressed. Freud gave his new free association method a new name, 
He took the ancient Greek word for mind or life breath, psyche, and added to it a robust scientific term, analyze. Psychoanalysis was born. In 1895, Breuer and Freud published their findings in a landmark book, Studies on Hysteria. Freud was keen to find a single unifying reason for hysteria and neurosis, to offer their theory a kind of breakthrough moment. And he started to see sex as a central issue. The more cautious Breuer disagreed, but another friend proved far more receptive, the physician Wilhelm Fleece. Sexual morality had long been framed by religion and by and large had been unremittingly repressive for centuries. But Fleece was one of a growing number of medical researchers who embarked on a scientific study of sexual identity and behaviour, unconstrained by orthodox moral judgments and what was generally considered to be perversion. Encouraged by the open-minded fleece, Freud began to hone his ideas about hysteria and sexual issues. In April 1896, he went to read a paper to the Viennese Society for Psychiatry and Neurology. He described the job of treating patients with hysteria in epic terms, as if he were an explorer archaeologist, sifting through the remains of an ancient ruined city, trying to find clues and evidence. Imagine that an explorer arrives in a little-known region where his interest is aroused by an expanse of ruins, with remains of walls, fragments of columns, and with... No Freud claimed to have found a singular cause in all his neurotic cases, something he likened to discovering the source of the Nile. His daring theory, the seduction theory, was that all neuroses were the result of some kind of sexual abuse in childhood, typically by the father. But rather than the glory that he was expecting, the paper was met with bewilderment and scepticism. One eminent neurologist in the audience dismissed it as a scientific fairy tale. This frosty reception just enhanced Freud's view that he was an embattled pioneer, tackling taboo subjects. However, in little more than a year, even he would concede that his seduction theory was fatally flawed. Hysteria was so widespread that to imagine so many men were paedophilic abusers was highly implausible. With hysteria afflicting Freud's own family, the idea that his father Jacob could also be guilty was the final straw. <laughs> Other speculations, however, would prove far more enduring. At the heart of Freud's thinking was how and why discomforting past thoughts could become repressed, only to be woven into the symptoms and psychic knots of everyday life. Freud believed that the unconscious mind held the key. The unconscious mind had been imagined and debated right across the human experience for many centuries. But Freud was one of the first to take a really systematic approach to try to add precision to the perceptions of the unconscious mind. A painful personal tragedy would trigger his big breakthrough. In 1896, Freud was devastated by the death of his father. Freud wrote to Fleece, my inner self, my whole past has been reawakened by this death. I now feel completely uprooted 
But in fact, these complex, intense thoughts would have a catalyzing effect on him. Freud had been experimenting with self-analysis, scrutinizing his fragmentary childhood memories and deep-seated terrors. The loss of his father intensified that exploration and the secret of his self-analysis, he started to analyze his own dreams. saw dreams as having any scientific substance. But Freud chose to think differently. He looks at dreams as something that is multi-layered. There is the story that people remember when they wake up. But for Freud, that story is only the surface of our dream. What lies underneath is what he calls the latent dream thoughts. But those latent thoughts become distorted, they become censored. Why does this censorship need to happen? Well, you see, these dream thoughts, they contain all the repressed wishes and thoughts and fantasies that consciousness considered to be disturbing and troubling. Were they not to be censored, then they would manifest themselves in all their disruptive force. For Freud, a dream is essentially a fulfillment of an unconscious wish. How are Freud's ideas about the unconscious evolving at this time? For Freud, the unconscious is no longer just a set of traumatic memories. It's a container of wishes and thoughts and fantasies that have been self-generated by the mental life of every human being. Well, what's the value of these for Freud? I mean, what's he doing with this raw material? Within his clinical practice, he would piece together the various associations that people bring to the story that they remember. And with those bits, bits and pieces, he would try to arrive at a certain understanding of those unconscious repressed wishes that sit underneath. With Freud's theory, we as human beings can look and think about our dreams as productions of our mind that actually reveal something about who we are and that's extraordinarily valuable. Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, offered a radical new understanding of human nature, with the unconscious a reservoir of repressed inner desires and irrational impulses the hidden source of what motivates and makes us. There's an interesting detail in the story of the publication of the interpretation of dreams. And although this book was actually published in 1899, it was branded with the date 1900. Freud was telling the world that the theories in here would define the 20th century and that they'd herald the birth of a daring, brave new world. But this brave new world was riddled with anxiety. It was said that to be Viennese was to be a question mark. Liberalism had failed to deliver real power to the middle classes, who felt threatened by a rising urban population. In this climate, an appetite grew for new experimental art that explored beneath the rational surface of human existence. Freud's theories perfectly matched the zeitgeist. In his next book, Psychopathology of Everyday Life, he continued to dig deep. In this, he argued that our repressed desires emerge not just in our dreams, but infiltrate our waking lives too. One interesting case he cites was when a high-ranking Austrian politician opened an important debate in Parliament with these words. I announce the presence of so many honoured gentlemen and therefore declare the session as closed. This very public slip revealed his repressed frustration that the session would be a complete waste of time. And of course, we still use the phrase Freudian slip in everyday life today usually to refer to a revealing or embarrassing verbal faux pas.
Although Freud believed that our unconscious desires broke through due to triggers in our current lives, it was how those mysterious impulses were shaped by our past experiences that really preoccupied him. Something that finds echo in his consulting room. When Freud enthusiastically gathered together all these fabulous ancient artefacts, he didn't think of them as dead objects. For him, the past wasn't a kind of museum that you could choose whether or not to visit. It was alive, dynamic, present in our day-to-day -day lives. He thought that past experiences had something vital to tell us. In fact, it was a story from classical Greece that would inspire his next big idea. Freud attended a performance of a Greek tragedy by Sophocles. Good. Action. Was hast du, Oedipus? Was ist es, dass deinen Geist so niederschlägt? Frag mich nicht. Doch sag mir erst, wie Laios aussah und wie alt er war. Oedipus Rex tells the story of a young man who inadvertently kills his father and then marries and has children with his mother. Groß war er und weiß sein Haar. Und deinem Ansehen nicht weit entfernt. When Oedipus discovers the terrible truth, he stabs out his own eyes. Freud saw this story as a paradigm to explain his own repressed sexual feelings. Genau, anno intensiver. This is what he wrote to Fleece. A single idea dawned on me. I found in my own case too the phenomena of being in love with my mother and jealous of my father. And I now consider it a universal event in early childhood. Freud named this psychosexual drama the Oedipus Complex. He came to believe that little boys had to work through hidden fears of castration by their fathers, punishment for desiring and seeking possession of their mothers, and that little girls were infatuated by their fathers but had to deal with complex feelings of inferiority because they themselves didn't have a penis, what Freud calls penis envy. Freud believed that if these complicated feelings weren't resolved, internal conflicts would be stored up, only to cause adult neuroses later in life. Freud was keen to test out his theories about repressed sexual issues. And in October 1900, the opportunity arose to do just that. A new patient walked into his office, a 17-year-old girl who he'd give the pseudonym Dora. She was his first and his most famous case study. Dora was exhibiting hysterical symptoms, a nervous cough and suicidal thoughts. One of the most shocking things in the story is that when she was 13 or 14, her father's best friend, Herr Kay, um, uh, manipulated the situation to get her alone in his office and kissed her. Um, and um, Freud says, well, this was thoroughly hysterical that she was disgusted by um, the, uh, the kiss. And then he goes on to say that she must have felt his erect penis against her body and that this must have sexually aroused her. And he makes it his business, really, to show her <clears throat> that she really does sexually desire her K and that she's repressed that desire from consciousness. I have to say, when you look at Dora's case, there does seem to be a trope developing here, that you have these young women who are very troubled, and men like Freud kind of pounce on them to, to, to use them for medical material. Yes, it has the sort of arrogance of the man of science and that he uses Dora and other patients as simply guinea pigs for his scientific, confident scientific position. 
And how does it end? I mean, how, how does Dora take all Not of this? well. Not well. Um, Freud, um, Dora walks out on Freud. And what he learns from that, though, is that he should have paid attention to the way in which she had transferred onto him all her feelings of hostility to Herr K. And in fact, after this case, he introduced the theory that psychoanalysis must pay attention to the ways in which patients transfer their unconscious and conscious feelings about significant people in their lives onto the, the psychoanalyst or the therapist. <laughs> Freud learnt valuable lessons from the Dora case. Yet his seemingly scientific method relied on subjective, some would argue, self-fulfilling judgments. It was a fundamental problem articulated by his once loyal confidant, Fleece, during a heated argument. The reader of thoughts is merely reading his own thoughts into other people, was Fleece's damning assessment. In 1902, Freud sent out a written invitation to four Jewish doctors, inviting them to come and meet here in his apartments. What would come to be known as the Wednesday Psychological Society gathered every week in his waiting room, and their first topic was a subject very close to Freud's own heart, the psychological function of smoking. A good cigar after a meal was part of bourgeois Viennese culture, but Freud took cigar indulgence to a whole new level. He smoked 20 cigars a day and considered the pleasures of the cigar a substitute for what he called the single greatest habit, masturbation. The Wednesday group discussions helped Freud to advance his ideas on sexuality resulting in a groundbreaking publication. Three essays on the theory of sexuality. So what he does in this book, he introduces a concept of enlarged sexuality. Because at the time, sexuality was very much restricted to people having sex. Whereas for Freud, it's about eroticism, it's about attraction, it's, it's about excitement and everything in between. He also sees it being at work in children. I mean, that's very controversial, isn't it? So, so how does he see this sex drive, this libido developing in children? Shortly after a child is born, it goes through an oral phase. Freud observes that when a child is being fed, that it can derive some satisfaction or gratification from that, which allows us to look at that experience as something that can be deservedly called erotic. So he thinks he's identified this sex drive in children. In what way does he see this playing out in adult life? It plays out in so far as it informs our sexual identity, our sexual fantasies, our sexual orientation. It informs who we are as human beings. But it's not a formula. Each and every individual has to find his or her way through this process. As a result of which, in a sense, one could say that we are all equally abnormal. There is a possibility, though, isn't there, that he's got this all wrong? That it's not all about sex? Yes, people have said Freud's got it all wrong, but I think if we use an enlarged concept of sexuality, we actually do come to the conclusion that a lot of our mental world is conditioned by this drive. Freud's progressive theories of sexuality spoke to a generation of young Viennese, cynical about the church and repressive morality. But his growing popularity had its dangers. Freud feared, not without reason, that because his circle was mainly Jewish, anti-Semitism would mean that his ideas would never be fully accepted. He was anxious that psychoanalysis would be labelled a Jewish science. A solution came in the form of a Swiss Gentile from Zurich who visited him in 1907. I was then a very young man still, and, uh, and he was uh, the old man 
so I settled down to learn something first. Carl Jung was one of the brightest young psychiatrists of the day. Freud bestowed rapturous praise on him, and in return, Jung came to revere Freud. Given Freud's antipathy to religion, it's rather ironic that his movement was beginning to look a bit like a religious cult, with psychosexuality, its key doctrine, Freud, its high priest, and Jung, the evangelist, who promote Freud's message. But the evangelist soon became a heretic. Jung reinterpreted one of Freud's key terms, libido, which Freud understood as sexual drive, to mean all mental energy. And he also took issue with what he saw as Freud's obsessive focus on the Oedipus complex. When he had thought something, then it was settled. While I was doubting all along the line. Their friendship ended acrimoniously, with Freud calling Jung crazy and out of his wits, while Jung's parting shot was no less provocative. Your technique of treating your pupils like patients is a blunder. In that way, you produce either slavish sons or impudent puppies. I am objective enough to see through your little trick. But whilst Freud faced dissent and a splintering of his movement, his name and his ideas were to reach global prominence due to a pivotal event. In 1914, the heir to the Habsburg throne was assassinated, triggering a war with Serbia. Freud's sons left for the front line of a conflict that would become World War I. The war threw up new challenges for physicians, the mysterious breakdowns suffered by soldiers. Their disconnected speech and nightmares were diagnosed as symptoms of physical shocks to the brain, shell shock. But it quickly became apparent that soldiers who weren't operating on the front line, who weren't exposed to exploding shells, were also suffering. So the physiological explanations just didn't stand up. Often written off as cowardly or weak, many of these soldiers were forced back into action within a few days. But Freud started a debate which would lead to today's widely accepted condition of post-traumatic stress disorder. Freud believed that war neurosis was a psychological rather than a physical problem. He thought that shell shock must be an emotional trauma triggered by the horrors of conflict. And by the end of the war, others were starting to believe him. World War I was a breakthrough moment for the psychoanalytical movement. But for Freud personally, it cast a long shadow. Post-war inflation wiped out most of his savings, undermining his comfortable life in Vienna. Spanish flu swept through the city, killing his beloved daughter Sophie. And even though all his sons returned, they were scarred by the experience. Freud began to question some of his core theories. For him, sexuality had been singularly responsible for neuroses. But in 1920, he published Beyond the Pleasure Principle and posited a second basic force in the mind a death drive. Before, he'd seen aggression as a sadistic aspect of the sexual instinct, the urge for mastery, the drive to dominate the sexual object. But now, with the raw experience of humanity's dreadful capacity for self-destruction, he started to focus instead on the fatal psychological impulses within us. 
Freud wanted us to face up to inward as well as outward aggression. He suggested that the death drive was part of the human condition, a powerful, deep-seated wish to undo the bonds of life. But Freud's revisions didn't end here. Freud proposed that the mind was made up of three elements. There was the id, an entirely unconscious part, the cauldron of our passions, where our death drive and our urge for sex could be found. Then there was what he called the superego, an internal conscience which could impose impossible ideals and inflict merciless criticism. The superego was a kind of strict moral guardian, in conflict with the pleasure and death-seeking urges of the id. Navigating between the warring mind and external reality was what Freud called the ego. Freud thought that psychoanalysis could help to strengthen the ego, although he never imagined that we'd be free of these internal conflicts. The best we can do is simply to live with them. Freud's ideas were eagerly taken up by a post-war generation in revolt against traditional values. In Europe and the US, a new egocentric permissiveness embodied in the glamour-driven world of dance music and moving pictures was taking hold. In 1925, the head of MGM, Samuel Goldwyn, called Freud the greatest love specialist in the world and reportedly offered him $100,000 to advise on the making of Antony and Cleopatra. Freud curtly declined. Yet as Freud's cultural influence soared, other, more insidious forces were gathering. Forces which would threaten his very existence. In neighbouring Germany, Adolf Hitler rose to power. Jews were immediately targeted and Freud's books were burnt in the streets. In 1938, Troops marched into Vienna. It's me. That is the crowd cheering Hitler. Look at the crowd. That's our house with the swastikas on it. Just days later, the Gestapo knocked at his door. Martha, ever the good host, asked them to leave their rifles in the umbrella stand. They behaved appallingly, throwing their weight around and breaking into the safe, but a line was crossed when they ransacked Martha's kitchen and tossed her table linen onto the floor. She gave them a thorough tongue lashing and they left. Freud now realised that he had to escape. But it's here we can start to get a measure of the broad appeal that Freud was starting to enjoy. Wildly disparate players collaborated to secure his safe passage, from the American president to a descendant of Napoleon, and even a Nazi bureaucrat who'd been blown away by his work when he was a student. For the second time in his life, Freud would be displaced. After 78 years in Vienna, his belongings were hastily packed up. This trunk in the Freud Museum in Vienna has revealed poignant new evidence of Freud's traumatic break with the past. We kind of rediscovered it uh, after it had been sitting right in this corner for uh, like two decades. Yeah. And when we moved it, we discovered this a label of Wien Westbahnhof to London. Ah, so we know that this is physically one of the bits of luggage that Freud would have taken with his family on the day that he, that he left. 
And you can still open it, can you? Yes, we can open it and see what's inside now. Because one thing that we discovered was very exciting to us, a squashed little box yeah. bearing Freud's handwriting, stating Martha for your 21st birthday from a poor happy man. Wow, it's a tiny little thing, isn't it? But that is freighted it's with really... history and memory. Yes, absolutely. Even without the jewellery inside, but still keeping the box with this personal little message. Yeah. What Freud encouraged us to do was to face up to our own past so that we could live better lives. Yes. And here is Freud and Martha's past incarnate. Yeah. It was very moving. In in Folge der deutschen Invasion mein Heim in Wien und kam nach England, wo ich mein Leben in Freiheit zu Ende hoffe. Now that is when the three men of the Royal Society came to present the book of the Royal Society for signature to my father. And I think on that same picture is the signature of Darwin. That was a very nice moment. But Freud was frail and severely ill. We had this couch put up for my father to rest. That's in his last year already. For around 15 years, his jawbone was riddled with cancer. Despite over 30 operations that affected his hearing and his heart, he refused to surrender the all pleasure that was almost certainly killing him. When his mouth was too painful to open, he'd wedge it with a clothes peg, just wide enough so he could smoke a cigar. He set up his study, just as it had been arranged in Vienna, and continued to see patients. When Freud sensed that death was near, he asked for his bed to be brought down here so he could be close to his desk, his books, and his beloved collection of ancient artifacts. In September 1939, Freud arranged to be given a fatal dose of morphine. But even after death, Freud's ideas continued to gain momentum. One of the impetuses that Freud gave to the 20th century was giving people permission to be different from other people, to recognize that there is very little that is abnormal because the abnormal is so normal. And perhaps most important of all, really making it possible to talk about sex. That really, I think, helped hugely. In the century after Freud's time, homosexuality, uh, sexual variety, um, much more sympathetic understandings about things that just used to be thought of as perverse. That was a big, big change in our uh, sensibility, certainly of the Western world anyway, and something for which we should thank him. There is an issue though, isn't there, because some of his ideas, I mean, it's not just pop science, it, it's positively bad science. It may even not be science at all, really, because the empirical basis for uh, Freud's work is incredibly slender. I mean, he self-analyzed, he analyzed his wife and daughter and a few neurotic Viennese ladies. And this is a very poor starting point for any, any real theory. He looked a lot at the unconscious. How far does that stand up against what we now know from science, from, from neuroscience, for example? Well, of course, neuroscience is making enormous strides now that there are instruments like the uh, MRI scanner, the magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And we've learned quite a lot. One thing we've learned is that most mental computation takes place in a non-conscious way, below the level of consciousness. And so memory is stored, physically stored, in the brain. And this must mean that many of the layers of, of uh, as it were, psychic deposits of, of 
all our lives are in there and could be recovered. And so it is not a million miles away from what Freud was groping for. Mm. He had the, the kind of strength to imagine what we're now understanding to be a true. That's exactly, exactly right. Uh, he was an imaginative genius, a wonderful storyteller. And, you know, even if you do a destructive job, which is you tear down a conventional fabric of ideas, that gives us an opportunity to see things differently. And I think he had enough wonderful insight to have struck the bell just very occasionally in ways that make us think this is an interesting aspect, an interesting perspective on human experience. While theories like the Oedipus Complex and Death Drive have been widely questioned, there's no doubting Freud's huge cultural influence. His ideas have become so embedded they're buried so deep within our day-to-day -day experiences that we take them for granted. So when advertisers scrutinise consumers to create brands that appeal to our irrational desires, they are drawing on Freud's psychoanalytical techniques. It's one of the reasons that products are packaged in ways that promise youthful freedom, prestige and, of course, sex appeal. And Freud's influence is also there in how we make sense of who we are. The importance that we place on childhood experiences. Our openness to talk about the emotional complexity of our lives. Some people even see his focus on looking inwards as promoting our narcissistic, individualistic culture, making us self-absorbed, self-obsessed. What really mattered to Freud, I'd argue, is right here. His ashes are still in this ancient urn, one of his favourites, which celebrates the Greek god Dionysus, the god of wild, irrational impulses. So here in his final resting place, you have sex and lust and death and mania and the power of the past all mixed up together. For a man who told the world he was a scientist, this is a madly, wonderfully romantic last gesture. And a reminder too, perhaps, that Freud believed no matter how deeply we interrogate ourselves, there is an irrational part of our mind destined to stay in the dark. It's true that many of Freud's theories have been dismissed as wildly speculative, criticised for being unscientific, but the questions that he left us with are as cogent now as they were back then. Are we hostages to our pasts and to our hidden anxieties, or can we ever learn to understand our psyches, to be truly masters of our own minds? In the end, I succeeded. But the struggle is not yet over. <laughs>